the court of, uh, what is it, the court of governors. That's now the uh, court of council and governors, uh, which is essentially the new kind of president of the LSE, which is great. Um, so I have the pleasure to welcome you all here uh, with a very remarkable uh, alumni, uh, Sir Stelios. Uh, Stelios will be with us uh, for the next one and a half hours. We'll uh, have a great uh, conversation, hopefully. Uh, Stelios will give a presentation, and then uh, we'll have uh, open questions. Um, so uh, in terms of the uh, usual kind of formalities, uh, of course, please uh, you know, switch your, uh, your mobile phones to silence. Uh, of course, you can tweet a lot. You know, you can uh, tweet uh, the uh, hashtag. We'll do uh, Stelios LSE. Um, uh, Stelios is at EasyJet. Uh, LSE is at LSE Events. I'm at Chris LSE. And then you can tweet and uh, join the discussion online. Um, essentially, today um, we will have a structure, we will have three different parts, you know, as a German being obsessed about the structure, of course, so uh, the first part will be uh, the, uh, you know, Sellers will give us a 20-minute presentation about uh, his life, his journey, uh, and, and what made EasyJet, Easy Group uh, so interesting. And then I will uh, have a conversation with him, uh, asking him a couple of uh, uh, questions. And then we will open up to you uh, for some crisp and inspiring uh, questions uh, from you. And so this leaves me uh, to introduce you to a man who uh, doesn't need a real introduction, but I'll do it anyways because I think he deserves it, uh, which is that Stelios set up EasyJet uh, at the age of 28. Uh, and he has done that now. Uh, that was 22 years ago. Uh, and since then, uh, he has uh, essentially transformed uh, European air travel, uh, you know, an airline that essentially you know, who of you knows the EasyJet, uh, just to get a, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and those of you who didn't, I think you're just still too sleepy, but you will wake up when he speaks. So I'm sure everyone uh, came across the EasyJet one way or the other. Uh, Stelius and his family are still the, uh, the largest shareholder of uh, EasyJet. And Stelius also uh, has the rights of the uh, Easy Group brands, where you have all these uh, interesting brands, you know, uh, everything from Easy Gym to uh, Easy uh, Bus. Uh, and he's always looking for uh, uh, exceptional partners. So those of you who are interested to kind of join in and uh, join the journey of Stelios, uh, I'm sure there will be a, a good communication topic for uh, afterwards. Um, so essentially, Stelios also, apart from kind of having built this business empire in a way, uh, has been very active on the philanthropic side. Uh, so he built the Stelios Philanthropic uh, Organization, which uh, essentially uh, works particularly uh, in the context where Stelios have been uh, has been active, so Greece, UK, uh, Cyprus, and uh, Monaco, uh, where he's uh, very active, particularly with scholarships, uh, with cash prizes for entrepreneurs, and also has a great food program where over 50,000 people get free food or are registered to get free food um, every day. Um, so it's, it's a great program in the kind of day-to-day -day life uh, of, uh, of uh, Greek subs. Um, so essentially, um, with 39 then, for all this, he got a knighthood uh, from the Queen. Uh, and he's also the general counsel of Cyprus in Monaco, so uh, kind of uh, nice representative functions. But most importantly, he's a graduate from the LSE. Um, he uh, graduated uh, with a bachelor in economics, right, in uh, 1987, I think that is. Um, and since then has been uh, very close to the LSE. We have some of the, do you want to raise your hands, the Stelios Stel Fellows? We have a couple of exceptional students the, the here. Scholars, the scholars, yes, yeah. the scholars. Yes, the Scalios uh, scholars won. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so these are exceptional students who uh, Stelios supports on their journey, putting his ideas uh, into practice. So this is kind of a little bit about Stelios. Um, and uh, he has been a great uh, supporter of the school via the Stelios uh, scholars and, uh, and other initiatives. And uh, now we are very excited to welcome him for a presentation and then we'll uh, join the community. Please welcome uh, Stelius. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will try and make it as interactive and as interesting as possible. I'm not going to bore you with a 20-minute PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I always like to start with a question for the audience. How many of you, by show of hands, have actually graduated from the LSE? Mm -hmm. Ah, the vast majority, okay. How many of you are current students? Oh, okay. Good, still some current students, wonderful. Um, I will start by showing you a picture of what I used to look like when I was at <laughs> university. <laughs> 
Um, that was actually from the year after, 1988, at the City University. But I used to turn up at the university in a, in a jacket and tie. Now I don't wear ties, back then I did, because I was trying to be more important than to <laughs> grow up. But um, you, you can see um, more feet, more hair, you know, everything was different. Um, I guess that look today is called a nerd, isn't it? Anybody who comes to, <laughs> anybody who comes to university is less like that. But <laughs> back, back then we had a, a film that just came out in 86 called Wall Street. So we thought we were going to look like Michael Douglas. Anyway, um, the other thing I like about the photograph, it, it's actually about us as students trying to predict the oil price in 1995. So in 1988, we're trying to predict the oil price seven years forward, which of course is complete rubbish, because you can't predict the oil price, and if you could, you wouldn't have to work for a living. <laughs> you sit in front of the computer and make money. But um, it's interesting that the oil price has always played a, a big part in my life. I started in shipping. Actually, my father had one of these big ships, or well, many of these big ships, that transported oil. And of course, in the airline business, you, you burn the damn thing. So oil price goes up, share price goes down, and vice versa. But anyway, that, that's my student years. Then there's another picture of me looking a lot slimmer than I am now, from 95, waving from the first flight that took off from Newton Airport. I, I had this um, bad idea to make the inaugural flight at 7 a.m., on, on a cold Thursday in November or something. So, you know, that, that was, you know, there was no glamour in, in the launch of EasyJet, if you like. That was Luton Airport, 7 a.m. on the 10th of November, 1995. But um, I think what I realized um, very, very early in the process is that I was really playing with two different assets or types of assets. The aeroplanes, the, the actual aircraft, the, the the equivalent of the ships in my shipping days, if you like, which is a hard asset. You buy it, you sell it, there's a price, it depreciates, you can borrow against it and everything else. And then it's the brand. Because I realized very quickly that airlines build very strong brands. You know, airlines, I think, get a disproportionate amount of attention and publicity for the size of business and scope of business they are. But I think it has to do with flying, it has to be to do with the fact that you trust them with your lives, so you need to know more about them. <laughs> anyway, so as, as I was building the airline, I realized I was building a brand at the same time. So we call it the easy family of brands. Uh, again, some more nostalgic pictures, but I'd like you to focus on the eight brand values, which we've sort of reversed engineered, if you like, engineered a few years later, but it's value for money, it's taking on the big boys, it's for the many, not the few. It's not an exclusive brand, it's a mass market brand. Um, we like to think of ourselves as having relentless innovation. We'd like to keep it simple at the same time. It's entrepreneurial. It's making a difference in people's lives. Uh, that, in simpler English, means um, being consumer-facing. In other words, it affects people directly rather than a B2B business model. And honest, open, caring, and fun. So, um, essentially, what I did um, in the 90s is I separated the airline from the brand. I kept the brand ownership in my own company, which is called Easy Group. And then we started building and creating other brands in the Easy family of brands. Uh, some, some of the most notable are here. You must have heard of Easy Hotel, at least. Um, but, of course, Easy Bus, Easy Car are, if you like, the most logical brand extensions after an airline. It's where you stay, how you get to the airport, you rent a car afterwards. Easy Gym is, you know, if you like, one step um, further, but it's also leisure and, um, and many others. I won't bore you with a um, commercial of all the Easy Brands, um, but I will leave you with one thought for those of you who are interested in law. How many people have studied law here as opposed to economics? Okay. 10% or something, 15%. Uh, lawyers must understand the concept of a trademark. A trademark is a monopoly on a name, and it gives you the right to basically sell it. And you can sell it outright, but more importantly, you can sell it uh, as a leasing, piecemeal, by pay as you go. 
So over the years, we've accumulated more than a thousand trademarks. And, and the end game, if you like, is to claim a mon monopoly and say, um, you know, we are the Easy Family of Brands, and if you want to start a business that starts with the name Easy, you come to us and we do a license. Now, what you were referring to earlier is that um, we're still actively looking for more partners, more licensees. As we speak, we're running a competition, for example, that for the right idea, we'll even pay 10,000 pounds to the to the recipient, if you like, with a business model, the idea, to actually license the easy name and see how it goes. Subject to contract, as the lawyers say, but uh, we are actively looking for more partners, licensees. If you go to the easy.com website, you'll actually see the details. Um, and of course, just to prove how old I am nowadays, we put ourselves in a museum. So <laughs> there is this place in uh, Notting Hill, 111 Lancaster Road. It's a trendy part of London. So if you have nothing better to do on a Saturday afternoon instead of studying or working, now you're working, most of you, you can go and visit this museum of brands where basically over the last 30 or so years, I think they've accumulated the most incredible collection of uh, brand artifacts, anything from empty bottles of uh, detergent to uh, anything else you can think of. And it's incredible to see how brands have evolved over the last 100 years. So we're officially in a museum now. Now, um, I think I'm doing pretty well on timing, so uh, we'll take questions very soon. Um, this is how I earn the money, okay? The easy family of brands. And a few other things that you wouldn't have heard of, but let's keep it simple. Um, I decided that a portion of what I make has to go back to society. So I, I believe it's our duty. People who are lucky enough and fortunate enough to, to earn a bit of money should give some of it back. So um, what happens inevitably is when you uh, have been a graduate of the LSE and they read your name in the newspapers, you know, the LSE has people actually doing that for a living. Al Alison, where is Alison? Yeah, Alison is our, our alumni relations officer in advancement, uh, advancement and her job is to look for successful alumni uh, and as soon as they, uh, the name appears in the paper, they phone them up or they email them now and they say, come back to the school to speak. <laughs> the, the students would like to hear from you. Which, of course, it is nothing else than roping you in to start giving scholarships and <laughs> helping the school. So, um, and it wasn't Alison because my call was 11 years ago. So it was another American, uh, uh, your predecessor at the time. Reggie, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so depending what your uh, attitude to philanthropy is and finances, when that call comes, either you take it or you say, I'm too busy, sorry, I can't come back to the school. But once you start coming back to the school, eventually you give back to the school. <laughs> so, um, and that has happened three times in my case. The high school in Athens, the LSE, and then the city university where I did my master's. But I, I think it's a good way of giving back to society. Having made a joke about your job, Alison, um, I, I've always called this the exponential effect. In, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you about another project where it's literally food for, for very poor people. This is the opposite, if you like. Is you pick the brightest, the best, might not be the neediest, might not be the poorest, but you actually make it possible for them to come to one of the better schools, and then they can go on and make a difference. Uh, they can not only improve themselves and get a better job, but sometimes they go and create companies and create jobs for others. Some of them run countries or the finance ministers of their countries. Kevin, can I tell the joke about Greece? <laughs> so, um, I was reminiscing now with Kevin Featherstone that in 2007, the Greek alumni... How many of you come from Greece or Cyprus? Show of hands. Good, good show. Good. So, 2007, it was the high watermark of the Greek economy. The Greek LSE alumni held an event at the Zapion, a very, very sort of impressive building, neoclassical building, and the elite of the Greek economy was there, and I think 90% of them were LSE graduates. So the LSE was very proud of the stewardship of the Greek economy. <laughs> <laughs> the next year, the economy went down. <laughs> so... Don't congratulate yourself too, too much. 
remember, some of it is luck. <laughs> there is a cycle. So um, that's about scholarships. Um, this is a sort of London-based program where, um, again, in the theme of entrepreneurship, but I decided to focus it on people with a disability. How many of you have heard of Lena Cheshire Disability, the Lena Cheshire charity? They should be doing a better job marketing themselves, but they've been around for many, many years, and they support people with disabilities. So they came to me and said, can you help us? I said, I can write a check and never see you again, or we can try and do something together that lives, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a small institution, if you like. So every year for the last uh, 11 years, we give uh, prizes to people who have a disability and started a business. Can you imagine how unique and rare that is? Imagine entrepreneurship, you know, only X percent of people can start a business, and then you superimpose on that the test of disability. So it, it, they're very inspiring individuals. So every year in November we do this event, and um, it's really the toughest decision I have to make in award giving, because you, know, you look at people who are all worthy and they're all you know, in difficult situations, and you say, how do I choose? Do you choose the the one with the most difficult disability, or the one with the best financial results. It's always difficult. Anyway, so that's what we do in, in the UK. Then in Greece, I started after the <laughs> 2008, yes, so it was, it was still the economy was flying high. So I remember um, you know, 50,000 uh, euros as a gift, and people used to laugh at it, that's nothing. That's, that's one night at the bazooka, you know, we don't know. <laughs> That's not a lot of money. So, um, uh, over the years, I've, um, bazooka, in case you didn't realize, it's, a, it's an entertainment place in, in Greece. So, um, 10 years later, obviously the economy is in a much worse state, but I'm delighted to say, and I almost take it this as a good news, entrepreneurship is alive and kicking in Greece. We had, um, we're giving more prizes of a lower amount, so 30,000, 10,000, several people every year. We had 88 applications this year, which I think is very inspiring because, again, there are criteria. Started recently, uh, less than 40 years old, again, focusing on the young. Um, and, you know, I, I saw their numbers today because the, the judging is later this month. Um, the highest turnover, all of them are startups in Greece, started by people less than 40 years old. And I would say the average turnover was already three quarters of a million euros. So th there are people who are doing very well. Next to the poverty and the unemployment, you have people who actually want to work for themselves and start businesses. Another in interesting statistic factoid is that in the application form we said, would you discuss an easy brand license? Would you like to take the easy brand as under license? 80% of them said, let's talk about it. So there is a lot of entrepreneurship in Greece. Cyprus. I, I know I asked about Cyprus earlier. How many people are actually from Cyprus? Hands up. OK. We're, we're, we're a small island, OK? My parents were born there. I was born in Athens, so sometimes I'm a Greek, sometimes I'm a Cypriot. <laughs> in reality, I'm a professional foreigner. Right? Wherever I am, I'm from somewhere else. But, um, Cyprus is a divided island of a million people. And I'm going to oversimplify things at the risk of offending some of my compatriots. But you take an island where a million people live, and you draw a line um, about two-thirds, one-third. I think it was a British general who drew that line, actually. <laughs> and um, you say the Greek Cypriots live south of that, and the Turkish Cypriots live north of that. And then you create a wall, like the Berlin Wall. Um, the Berlin Wall came down. And the Nicosia wall is still up. And you still have to give a passport to cross the green line and the buffer zone to go from the one side to the other. Which for me, as a trained economist, I think is, you know, it's, it's meaningless. You shouldn't have to live like that on a small island like that. So I started about uh, nine years ago to actually try and bring the two communities together. Now, let me make it clear. I'm not a politician. I'm not, I don't care about politics. I don't want to get involved in politics. Um, today, there was an online rumor in the online media in Cyprus I was going to run for president of Cyprus. <laughs> and I categorically deny that, OK? 
I will not be the Donald Trump of Cyprus. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to do here is make sure that the two communities do not fight each other. And if they don't fight each other, hopefully a solution will be found. I don't want to get involved in making the solution happen in the sense that it's politics and it's negotiations and inevitably there, is, um, there are touchy issues and everything else. So what I've decided to do is very simply give them awards for cooperating. If you have one Greek Cypriot and one Turkish Cypriot and they cooperate, they are eligible for this award. And they cooperate the next year, they're eligible again. And, and therefore you keep cementing these um, relationships that hopefully will never, uh, well, will, will um, sort of guarantee lasting peace on the island. And whether the political issue is resolved or not, that, that has ups and downs. There was a time, when were the Geneva talks? I think it was February, that people thought, you know, it's going to happen, this is it. Um, but again, it went backwards now. So they're saying it's, it's not likely to happen. But for me, this is a program that would last a long time, and I'm there to sort of, um, I can't keep increasing forever, but we're now at 750,000 euros in this year alone. So the prize is small, it's 10,000, but I now give it to 75 teams to try and reach more people. So, um, and this is a photograph from, I mean, this is on the green line actually. The building behind is uh, called the Lidra Palace, where um, British troops are actually based. Based in the United Nations um, peacekeeping force. Anyway, that's Cyprus. Now, this is the heartbreaking stuff. Um, it started in Cyprus, but it really <coughs> um, took off, if that's the right term, in, in Athens. In other words, the numbers are beyond any expectation and beyond any belief I had when I started. So, I always come prepared. This is a chocolate wafer. Um, it's made in a factory in Greece. It's available in the sort of the kiosks in the supermarkets, normally commercially for about a euro, 80 euro cents to a euro. We buy a very large quantity of them. We co-brand them so they are less likely to be sold, and then we open distribution points like this one, and we invite people to come and um, collect them. No criteria. You only have to register. In other words, give us a name and a, you know, something, a telephone number or something. Primarily to manage the distribution people, in other words, to, to control the, the numbers. Now, 3,000 people were queuing in this location every day for 20 minutes, half an hour, to receive two, three of these. Can you imagine how much need these people were in? And inevitably, it's people from all walks of life. It's... Um, um, people who were born and raised in Greece, and there's a Greek expression, neoptochi, isn't it? Newly poor. People who were better off and, and sort of fell, fell in hard times. But inevitably you have the, the recent immigrants and the refugees. Athens is a big city, it's about five million people. So it is not surprising that, you know, in a big city like that, in such an economic um, crisis, we can distribute 25,000 of these every day in different points. Um, again, I'm looking at Kevin. They reckon the GDP has shrunk by 40%, isn't it? No, no, I think um, 28 30. Yeah, that's the official, but what will... <laughs> Officially 30%, I think it shrunk by, by 40%. Because some of it was black and it was never measured and everything else. But when was the last time in times of outside war, times of peace, where you, you took 11 million people you showed them a better way of life, and then you made them go backwards 40%. It's really, it's really unthinkable almost what has happened. I'm not blaming anybody. Well, I have a German presenter here, and I could blame the Germans, but... <laughs> it's not your fault, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, the, um, the weeping boy, I think, of the Greeks is uh, Volkan Schäuble. The, the finance minister. He's more famous in Greece than he's in Germany, I think. <laughs> so, um, again, I'm not here to make political statements, but can, just imagine the, shuff, the suffering. Eh? Imagine how you live today and take 40% of it away. 
So it, it, it's really difficult. So some people say this is not food, this is not charity, it's a waste of money, you know, you should be promoting education. Yes, I do a bit of this as well, and, and, and entrepreneurship. But they need calories to live another day. Otherwise, they wouldn't be queuing for 20 minutes. And um, comparatively speaking, Cyprus is doing better. The numbers in Cyprus is going back, down, which means better economic recovery. The numbers in Athens are going up. These are the numbers in Athens. And um, just to explain a bit the business model, because there is an element of me and the easy family of brands philosophy in here, in the sense that <coughs> I like to give back in a very efficient way. In the same way my businesses are efficient, I expect philanthropy to be efficient. So what we do, and I've given you three examples here, but we've changed the snack many times over the last three, four years, is we try and find popular snacks that are produced locally and are available for the price point I gave you, around 80 uh, euro cents to a, a euro. Um, we do it in Greece, we do it in Cyprus now with a local snack, and even in North Cyprus. As part of the reapproachment between the two communities, we went to North Cyprus, rented a, a property, and found the, this donut over there. So local snack, locally produced, long shelf life, um, no fridge, no cooking facilities, um, ready to eat, available immediately, efficiently. How else can you process 3,000 people in four hours? So I'm, I'm, I'm very, if I can be blunt, I'm very pleased with myself we found this business model because you can help a lot of people very efficiently, very quickly, in, in, in sort of in people who are in need because they're self-selecting. They wouldn't be queuing for 20 minutes if they didn't need this. This is not money for nothing or food for nothing. It's, it's filling a need. So, and that's the last slide, I promise, and then we, we'll take questions from the Germans. But um, <laughs> um, back to the British now. Um, in deciding how to create a lasting legacy, I chose the British legal system to create a foundation. Um, there is something in this country called the Charities Commission that regulates charities. So if you wanted to start a charity, you go to the Charities Commission and you ask for a permission. And if you're ever curious enough, you go to the Charity Commission and you Google, you search for the Stellius Foundation, and all the numbers come up. So it, it gives me a sense that this transparency creates accountability. And hopefully, with the right endowment, this, this sort of legal entity can actually live forever. Which, they're very big words, live forever and do good forever, but I, I think if it's structured properly, you know, this, this will happen. And that will be a, a good legacy for me. On this note, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. <laughs>
I mean, in an airline, you have operational risk, God forbid. I mean, Touchwood has had, has had a unblemished safety record, but you know, if something happened in the early years, that would have been the end of it. You have financial risk. Um, I, again, I was lucky enough to be able to raise money from the stock market five years into the venture, which gave it financial stability, if you like, to buy all this aircraft. And, and um, I, I think I'm now focusing on this concept that an income stream is more valuable than a capital gain. You know, a, a lot of people during the dot-com bubble, you remember the dot-com bubble, 2000, 2001? You know, the name of the game is start something, you know, it goes up in value 10 times, you sell it and, and you, you get out. I mean, that you can do only once. <laughs> Very few people have done it twice. And, and you know, if, you remember it's a cycle, so the cycle comes back every 20 years or whatever. So, you know, the lesson I've learned is be more focused on, on income rather than capital gain. The, the, the perpetual, not the one off. Interesting. And how did you, so, so you mentioned the, the brand values of EasyJet, the, the eight, nine, nine brand values. Um, how, did, how did you scale that? So I, I can imagine, I mean, being one of the few European brands that essentially, you know, from scratch scaled to, what, 31 countries. How did you scale these core values? I remember the times, maybe you, you can tell these anecdotes around um, when, when you entered a plane and, and you know, apologized <laughs> personally um, to passengers when you were late. And I think, like, scaling these kind of values, how, do you, how did you do that part? Well, you hire good people to do that. <laughs> I, I can't claim... Um, expertise in scaling things. In, in reality, I like big, small businesses. When the businesses get to a certain scale, other people uh, run them. But, um, you know, I think, I, I think the, the brand values are created by years and years and years of experience for the customer. You know, yes, you have to get the staff to deliver that experience, but the brand values live in the mind of the customer. So if you keep delivering um, well, then that creates more value. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel, so in terms of your, your personal journey, when you, so one thing we didn't mention at the beginning is that you already had an exit uh, when you were uh, quite young, I think with, with in the mid-twenties with another company. The shipping entity, that, yeah. That yeah. went uh, over, over a billion. So essentially you're a serial entrepreneur <laughs> who builds serial businesses. And um, what do you feel when you, when you think about the kind of key characteristics that helped you um, shape these businesses apart from the risk-taking? What do you feel were the factors where you said, okay, if I, if I wouldn't have done this, 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 this wouldn't have worked? I'm well, for those business. who are not familiar with uh, my family business, uh, my father was in shipping. Shipping is a very cyclical business. So, again, I wanted to get, you know, Greek father, Greek son, there were a few shouting matches when we were working together. <laughs> so I said uh, one day, can you please give me some money and I start my own shipping company? And I was lucky to have bought at the right moment. The market went up a few years later. And then I learned, you know, you have to get out. Because in a cyclical business, it's a matter of time before it goes down again. Mm -hmm. So, um, would I do it again today? I think it would be a lot easier to buy shares in existing companies, mm -hmm. which I listed, mm -hmm. rather than have to go through the process of creating a company from nothing. But, you know, if you're in a cyclical business, you buy and sell. Uh, I now prefer uh, more st stable income streams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the, the kind of lessons you take from your entrepreneurial efforts into the kind of philanthropy, um, uh, into your philanthropy activities. How do you essentially, um, what are your decision metrics in terms of how you, you know, how you look at potential, um, potential uh, organizations that you want to support and, and what is your kind of motivation? What is the, the core that, that sits behind it all? As you may have noticed already, the, uh, the foundation, the charitable activities are very much focused in the places I've lived and worked. So one, one of the decisions you have to make is do you go and help the neediest in Africa, for example, or do you stay close to home? Bill Gates Foundation has made a mission statement to eradicate disease in Africa. Something very, very big, and for me, way, way bigger than I can conceive. Um, you know, if you have the money, you know, go for it. But for me, close to home, you know, is, is important. Um, we started with good intentions about exponential effect and the brightest and the London School of Economics, and then the crisis arrived. And then, you know, 
you're sitting one day in your balcony in Monaco looking at all the yachts and say, you know, how do I help these Greeks and Cypriots? And it goes back to this. So it's, um, you have to adapt. And of course, um, you know, if I started, I looked at the soup kitchens. You know, you know this concept, the sort of in, mostly in America with um, the Great Depression. Um, and it's complicated, having to cook you know, warm meal every day for so many people, hygiene problems. So the result would have been, you know, help 10% of the people we're helping now. So I'm, I'm a great believer in efficient business models. I mean, th this is a retail model, basically. Mm -hmm. Just the retail point happens to be zero. So it's, um, it's good how you can cross uh, fertilize and learn from, mm -hmm. from business to charity and back. Yeah, which is actually something I was quite curious about. And I think a couple of people mentioned that earlier, the question of that, if you look at the trend that a lot of businesses try to integrate um, philanthropy with a business, and um, you seem to have kept them separate uh, very consciously. What, what is your kind of motivation? A very good that? question, actually. Um, I would like to think that the easy brand would live and do well financially well beyond my own natural lifetime, in the sense it's valuable enough for other people to take it over, run it, you know, you can securitize it, you can sell it, whatever. So I think the business will survive and do well in its own right. And then I've chosen to do philanthropy, if you like, under my own personal first name, which again will have its own legacy. And, um, you know, I think if, if EasyJet raises eight million pounds for UNICEF on a plane, um, is it EasyJet's charity or is it the passenger's charity? You know, essentially the money goes from the passenger. You must have seen this on EasyJet where they collect the, um, I mean, it's a very uh, worthwhile cause, but I'm always skeptical when big companies say we're doing charity. What they're doing is they're improving their image in order to sell more and you know, be more liked and everything else. I, I wanted to keep it separate and say the business is a business, maximize your profits, and then you know, if you want to do charity, do it in your own name. Well, there's a couple of follow-up questions which I'll yeah. keep for dinner uh, to, to not, uh, not, not take too much time for that. But I think another aspect I wanted you, to discuss you're buying is... buying dinner uh, to everybody? <laughs> everyone. Um, Food from the heart, yeah. <laughs> Um, distribution point on the right, as you call Yes, it. yes, and a bit of fruit with it. Um, so the kind of, yeah, um, vegetables and fruit. Um, but um, the, 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 the other point I wanted to, to briefly touch on, someone um, who, who kind of achieved this level of, of status and, and, you know, monetary kind of health, healthiness, uh, what does success mean to you nowadays? What do you, what do you say, oh my God, this is still something that thrills <laughs> you or that kind of gets you excited? Um, I'm not sure whether that's true or is, it's an anecdote, but I've heard once um, an expression, a phrase that um, we all spend most of our lives sort of striving to shape the second phrase in our obituary. So the, the first sentence in your obituary is usually spoken for. You know, I, I was the founder of EasyJet. That's the first sentence. The question is, what does the second sentence going to say? Let, let me sort of change the subject. Um, President George W. Bush, President of the United States from 2000 2008. What is the next sentence going to say? You know, messed up the war in Iraq, whatever, you know, whether you like the guy or not, it's irrelevant. But, you know, Obama now, Trump, <laughs> what will the, the next sentence say? So um, I, I think we're all fighting for the, next, the second sentence in our budget. Mm -hmm. Great, so we'll do an idea Sorry. competition for the second <laughs> sentence of Stadios. Uh, um, maybe something around EasyJet integrating foods into their exactly. business model. Yeah. Um, something about doing good, I think, would be a good second fantastic. sentence. Fantastic, yeah. Great. Um, and how do you feel in terms of what were the role models in your life? So who, who did you look up to when you, you know, throughout your life? Or, you know, who were these characters? Uh, I'm going to sort of partly dodge the question and give you several names rather than one, but, uh, you know. I think inevitably, going back to the Greek father, Greek son, my father was a great inspiration and role model for me, with all the positives and negatives. The way he was running his business was very Greek and unique in, in the shipping business, but I've learned a lot from him. And um, the, I mean, you must have seen the business model somewhere else. Virgin, maybe. You know, I, I admired Brunson when I was a kid. 
and I had the, uh, the opportunity to meet him before I started EasyJet. So, you know, I shouldn't really claim that this is terribly original. It has happened before. But, um, you know, there are so many other successful businesses. I mean, you know, from Apple to Facebook, where do you stop? I mean, sometimes I wonder whether, you know, when EasyJet floated, I could have sold. And I said, maybe if I've sold the whole thing and went to California, would I have, would I have created the next Facebook? Who knows? You know, I was young enough, I would have been crazy enough to do it. <laughs> but uh, I didn't. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's incredible how, you know, Steve Jobs came up with this thing and everybody's carrying it in their pocket now. And, you know, two billion people using a social network. I mean, a concept that didn't exist, um, what, ten years ago? Mm -hmm. Or even five years ago, it wasn't critical mass. So th there are some incredible business models. Which actually, I mean, yeah. so, so assuming that a lot of the people in the audience um, essentially now kind of, you know, take, take you as a role model or someone, you know, who potentially kind of inspires them. What is something when you have, you know, the kind of 32, 35 um, year old, like what would be the, 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 the thing that one, you know, from your perspective, what is the most valuable thing to do now? Or what, what would be... Start at 28 and get a rich father? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does that work? <laughs> Second option, option B. Find a venture capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, you have to take the risks early, but not too early. You know, it's incredible that, you know, it's, um, with age, you, you become more risk averse. Mm -hmm. So don't postpone to, for, to, for too long. Yeah, okay, so the hope for the older ones then is yeah. to take the license for easy into other areas. Well, I mean, franchising is so successful because people can be entrepreneurs without having to reinvent the wheel. I mean, why do people buy McDonald's franchises? I mean, they can sell hamburgers themselves, but you know, it's a safer way of, of making a living. Yeah. Well, at that point, last, last question to me, in terms of you have a, a room kind of full of bright you know, people, is there something where you feel at the moment, apart from the kind of expansion that, that we talked about, where you feel it would be great to you know, have people involved with or? I was given warning about this question, and I still haven't found the right answer. But <laughs> I'm going to make a wish rather than give you a, a, a pearl of wisdom and advice. Um, I hope one day soon, I don't know how many years, we'll wake up and there will be no lines outside the food from the heart in Athens. You know, it, it is heartbreaking what's happening, and it's one of these programs that I'll be happy when it becomes obsolete. You know, because that means success. It means the country is recovered and you know, there is no need to do this. So I hope that this will not be around forever. Unlike the foundation and the scholarships and the entrepreneurship, this has a finite life hopefully, but you know, who knows how many years. It's a bit like, I mean, I've heard Bill Gates speak the other day and said, 25 years after my demise, my foundation will shut down because there will be no more disease. <laughs> I mean, he's not that specific about it. So he set a target and he said, we'll eradicate disease in Africa and that's it. We'll close down and shut shop. So I think this is one of those we hope to, um, to make obsolete. Fantastic. Thank you so much for now. Thank so, you. So, and, um, so we'll, uh, we'll open up the floor now. We'll take three questions in a row. Um, please do keep it crisp. Sharp, witty, if you want. Um, it is why recorded. Not, why, why not one at a time? One, one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> why do I have to remember? To <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take one at a time. One at a time, please. Um, please uh, speak slowly. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll take one at a time. Um, let's start. I was I was briefed that uh, the LSE standard is to not say man or woman, but to say person. But please don't feel objectified by it. I'll just. Say, um, the person who's sitting over there, uh, yes. <laughs> and then you start, start describing them, and then that's more, even more objectifying. <laughs> Just smiling, yeah. Thank you. So my question is, as somebody who's in their 40s and didn't come to LSE till their 40s, um, so obviously I've got that eye for risk, you know, or lack of, um, what kind of advice would you give people who want to set up a business around managing people? Because what you've done, you've had to understand people. You've had to understand the people you bring on board, the teams you create and build in order to 
you know, reach the success that you've attained. So what have you learned along the way? Um, I don't consider myself an expert in managing people, and certainly I've never managed a very large group of people, large groups of people. Remember, I, I delegate. I sort of build something, and when it gets to a certain size, other people run it. Um, but, you know, it, it's always good to have the right incentives for people, align their interests with yours from the highest level to to the hourly rate you pay people. So I, I think, you know, align their interests. And, um, you know, I've seen companies turn around when you say to the management team, we'll give you as a bonus 20% of the profits. <laughs> Simple as that, you know, one sentence. And suddenly the business becomes profitable. But, um, you know, if, um, if you're looking to start a business, and sorry if I sound as if I'm selling my um, wares, but you can take any other franchise consider taking a franchise. I mean, you're still your own boss. You just have to plug into the system that other people have created and learn from their mistakes. And, and you, you manage your own small team. And again, entrepreneurs manage their own team. You don't have to manage the entire team. I, I don't even know how many employees work for McDonald's globally. It must be a, a staggering number. But it's actually one restaurant at a time that is managed. Thank you. Um, I, I hope I answered your question, but probably not. <laughs> I, I don't have secrets on how to manage people. <laughs> I forgot to mention, um, everyone please, for the alumni spirit, yeah. uh, say your name, uh, what your degree was in the name of, uh, of graduation. Um, and as I, um, so if you, if you still want to. Uh, oh, I, um, so my name is Lucy, yeah. and I studied anthropology, did a master's here two years ago. So I was intrigued what you said about Cyprus, because anthropologists look at what the social relations around trade, and of course, that's what you were talking about with your um, project in Cyprus. Thank you. And can you imagine that they, there was 30 years where you, couldn't, you were not allowed to cross? So you, again, you take a small number of people, you create a, a barrier between them, and, and they almost sort of, they didn't want to admit the other side existed. It's incredible. All right, let's take someone on this side here, the um, red uh, person in red. <laughs> Good evening, very nice to meet you, Sir Stelios. My name is Dr. Sonidou, Kiki Sonidou, I'm from Greece. I'm a doctor, GP with special interest in cardiology, I'm doctor of the Greek embassy. I'm going to stand up I want to ask you something, mainly as a doctor, I would say. Why have you chosen sweets? Serenada is a sweet of my childhood, I have to admit, in Greece. But you know that diabetes is one of our main problems in obesity. <laughs> I would be very interested in telling me why not bread, why not, why not something else, and what motivated you to choose sweets and not something else? Thank you. Great question. And, and here is a slide I prepared earlier. <laughs> like, like in the cooking shows, you know, they, they say how to do it, and then here's one I prepared earlier. But um, when we started in Cyprus, three and a half, oh, four years ago. Um, I literally paid people, some of them my long-term staff, some of them temporary, to take bread, take halloumi. How many of you like halloumi? <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> so slices of halloumi, take bread, put it in, put butter, put, you know. We started even with tomato and everything else. And, you know, it was taking, even with the most trained person, it was taking 15 minutes and, you know, it's costing a lot of money and, and you couldn't make enough of them to, to supply the demand the next day and everything else. So we went from prepared sandwiches to industrially prepared sandwiches, still savoury. And people were prodding me and said, you know, you have to keep it savoury, uh, it's not food otherwise. And then for the first time we tried, um, do you recognise this croissant here? Also in Greece, very popular. So, you know, that's industrially produced in a machine. So the price, the cost went down significantly. It has a long shelf life, doesn't need a fridge. You can enjoy it immediately, ready to eat, no, no cooking facilities. And um, the effect is that we managed to give a lot more of them away in a limited period of time every day than we could with sandwiches. And then we started experimenting. And of course, you know, it sounds as if I'm playing with people's lives here, but you know, I've tried giving two chocolates instead of three chocolates. I've tried giving a croissant, or the, the cake, the tzureki, the bread. The most popular for some reason is chocolate. 
people enjoy the calories and they enjoy the sweetness. And I don't think health issues are top of their priorities at the moment. You know, they may have diabetes, but they may not know about it. And they don't care because they need something to keep them going for another day. So, um, again, I didn't invent these things. They are very popular and they existed long before I started. So it means people like them. And, you know, I, I'm trying to be efficient. I'm trying to be, you know, productive. Remember the, the efficiency argument. If you, if you were there cooking for those, men, the, you know, for people every day, you could serve 10% of them in the same facility. So how many people think it should be savory to be called food? Yeah, fair enough. But, you know, it's all calories at the end of the day. That's what they need. And, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as the English say. <laughs> you know, you offer chocolate and the numbers go up. This chocolate wafer, this, um, this thing on the, on the left there, the right for you. Thank you. Thank you for the um, question. Um, we have, let's do someone in the middle. Yeah, um, the, the person here, um, third from the right. Yeah. All second. All right, that's it. All right. So this one doesn't work. We'll try another one. Um, do we have another microphone? Someone? Fantastic. Uh, Richard yeah. Schwartz. Uh, I did international relations, and also edited a magazine called Philanthropy Management, which actually covered uh, Stelios's bicommunal award one year. Mm -hmm. And I have a question about the, the foundation. To what extent do you continue your engagement with the recipients of the grants afterwards? In other words, do you have a relationship with your own alumni? Um, we do better than that. We continue to actually give them a prize. So qualifying and winning one year does not prevent you from applying again next year. And, and as we keep giving more prizes, it means that we almost allocate, reserve a certain percentage to go to past winners. Because longevity is important here. <coughs> you know, you're Greek Cypriot, you find a Turkish Cypriot, you do something together. You don't want that thing to break down in a, year time, in a year's time. You want them to still talk to each other. So um, the longer they've been working together, the more likely they are to win again. We, I, I, I never forget, we, we had a guy who applied seven times before he won. <laughs> and he got the, you know, the award for persistence. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's directly do the... Yeah, can no, I just, um, can I, yeah. before we yeah, go to the next point, can I make another comment about Cyprus and, uh, and the bicommunal nature? Um, 30 years ago, the, the, the separation of the island happened in 74. If I try to do anything like that in the 80s or 90s, well, 80s for sure, it would have been considered treason. It was unthinkable that you're paying money to the other side. So the island was very, very bitter about the division, and slowly they've come closer together. And what we're trying to do is destigmatize it, make it more acceptable, make it more social to, you know. Only two years ago, we found our first bicommunal couples, as in partners in life. And now one of the couples or two of the couples have children. And all of a sudden, you see bicommunal babies that didn't exist you know, a few years ago. So the, the point is to remove the stigma. You know, I, I was almost worried when we first sent the transfer to the other side. You know, am I doing something wrong? I mean, will I go to jail? <laughs> You're transferring money to North Cyprus. Do you know where that is? <laughs> that sort of thing. So it, it, it was very stigmatized, and we're trying to destigmatize it. Mm -hmm. right. um, so Angus uh, Williamson, um, yeah. International Trade and Development. A big admirer, Stelios, uh, of your business successes. Um, the question is going a little bit back more towards the business world. Um, you've got a reputation for your activism in terms of your investments um, and you're, you're relatively vocal. Do you think this is, is, is becoming a theme? Do you think this is... I'm just interested in your views of, of whether this is very important. Um, is it due to complacency of company boards? What, why is it necessary? Um. 
I don't know how many people in the room actually uh, follow um, shareholder activism. Sometimes people like you and I that read, read the, the financial columns of the broadsheet newspapers think that that's the entire world, but obviously, <laughs> you know, it's a very narrow um, sort of point of interest. But in very simple terms, I made some headlines in the business pages when I convinced EasyJet uh, run by an independent board, remember, I'm, that's not my company, that has many other shareholders, to go from a policy of distributing no dividends to distributing half the profits as a dividend, which I think it's a, as a shareholder, is a huge improvement because you are rewarding your shareholder every year. Now, why is it interesting in the newspapers? I think it's back to the personality sometimes, you know. Aviation, you know, big, big names, big egos. But, you know, um, there was a time that people thought that the only thing that matters is growth and dividends are not important. Uh, remember what I kept saying? I, I value income streams rather than capital gains. You know, if you buy the share at 10 pounds and it goes to 15 and you sell it, okay, you, you made 50%. But then what do you do? Whilst if you have an income stream, the, the dividend yield of EasyJet is now about 5%, round numbers. So by holding the shares, you get 5% of the value back every year. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. But um, why do we have to do it was your question? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's easier to run a company when you don't have to pay your shareholders, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Money for nothing, isn't it? We have a few bankers here. <laughs> My point is the board should be representing the shareholders. And why is it really necessary for larger shareholders to sort I, of I think up it was. Fuss? I, th I think it's a question of you shouldn't believe the newspapers. <laughs> I think it was a very logical thing to do, and it happened, and it happened, uh, you know, over two, three years. All right, thank you. Let's go up there in the, in the very last row in the back. Yeah. Uh, please again state your name, course, and your accreditation. Hi, um, my name is Nick Hosthaus. Um, I actually went to King's, um, so sorry for that. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> Uh, so yes, yeah, sorry for stealing this question, but um, we have a glamorous idea of entrepreneurship uh, generally today, but was there any time uh, in your experience where you didn't see a way out or you thought that you were destined to fail, <laughs> having been myself a failed entrepreneur at this stage? It'd be interesting to know your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've made my fair share of mistakes too, don't worry. Um, Highest risk moment was probably September 11th for the airline. Can you imagine? You know, you're a small company still growing, and all of a sudden these horrible things happen, and you know they close the airspace, and you know. So, I, we survived. But you know, if you ask me, the highest, the lowest point, the highest risk, lowest point in in, in the evolution of of the airline was probably September 11th. Um, Another big mistake I made is I was carried away by the dot-com bubble. Um, I, I was part of it and you know, I, I created a business called Easy Internet Cafe. The, the older ones might have even been there and used a computer. But my idea was take a big space on the high street, put a lot of computers in, one pound an hour is a very cheap way to um, uh, use the internet for people who've never used it before. But of course I underestimated technical obsolescence. I mean, uh, most of the business was about people checking their emails, and then when I first uh, saw the first smartphone, the BlackBerry, well, at the time, I, I said, we have to get out. So it was already declining, and I had to close, sell and close as fast as I could. So don't underestimate technical obsolescence, and don't fight it, don't try and go against it. But you know, a September 11th event is survivable. Especially if it's not your fault fundamentally. So you know, if you have if you have enough resources, be well capitalized. Which I, I know it's a problem sometimes. If you're trying to run a bigger business than your resources. Thank you. Uh, yeah, someone. Let's do the um, yeah. yeah. Gentleman there, uh, the person there. Hi, I'm Craig. Uh, European Studies, 1998. Uh, my question for you is, obviously it's, it's brilliant that you're taking uh, corporate social responsibility so seriously in, uh, through philanthropy, but a lot of brands and a lot of business owners don't. 
and it makes good sense for you, it makes good sense for the community, it makes good sense for the business. What advice would you give to those brands who are cynical about this and they don't think it works? I think it's for the people to do philanthropy and I think the businesses should do what they have to do to maximize their profits. I think I made a reference to this earlier, that this is not corporate social responsibility. This is me spending my own money, basically. So, uh, for my own you know, satisfaction, feeling, feeling of um, giving back to society. Uh, a business, you know, is Unilever doing charity or is it just increasing sales of their products? And if you're a shareholder in Unilever, do you really want them to, to go out and spend the money on, um, on charity? I think they should do enough to, you know, as part of the image building, but I think it's for the, it's for the individuals to be generous. Do, do you disagree? Uh, I've got that point anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So. Cor corporate giving is a big business in the sense that, you know, they have deep pockets, they have a lot of money to give. You know, why not take it? But um, I'm focusing mostly on my own sort of legacy. And it's interesting, I think it's, it's a very interesting discussion to be had. I don't know, are there similar questions? Because I'd love to briefly dive into that discussion. I think that's an important discussion around the question of the role of business and, and if that's integrated or not, or, you know, what, what that, uh, the gentleman here, yeah? Tell them at least the color of their shirt or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or is that uh, politically incorrect? Yeah, let's start here and then we'll go, yeah. <laughs> I obtained my PhD on statistics of 20 years prior to the study and a PhD four years later. So I'm old enough to remember the degree of criticism that you did get came in for in the early years. What, what gave you the strength to keep on going? Was there any, would you like to comment on the factors that I guess we're eternal optimists, isn't it? It's the entrepreneurs, you know, we, we never give up. I mean, I, I pride myself on knowing when to cut my losses and when to get out. But equally, I think we're eternally, we're eternal optimists. Keep going. <laughs> you know, criticism is an opportunity to improve. You know, it's, uh, you know, a delayed flight is an opportunity to try and win back those customers. Did you, did you notice the, um, the, the United Airlines um, <laughs> problems with um, overbooking? I mean, it's, it's quite incredible what some built companies do. And I have to be careful because a couple of days later, EasyJet was also in the spotlight about a, a similar but not identical problem. So United had a policy, which I think they had to change, that said even if everybody was on board, was properly seated, they had a boarding pass, and they wanted to position crew, they can actually walk on board and remove passengers randomly or by accepting an amount of money. And if they were not leaving, they had the right to use airport police, whatever that means in America, I don't know, to come and remove them by force. I mean, how do you, who comes up with these ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, positioning crew is more important to the degree that you, 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 you start a fight with one of your customers. You know, I, literally three days later, EasyJet came into a bit of a, in the spotlight for what was essentially a mistake and I, I analyzed it out of, you know, remember I'm the ultimate steward of the brand, I, I care what happens with, when the brand comes under criticism. So the, the, the mistake that happened at EasyJet is that um, there is always a policy of overbooking, there's no way of denying it because 5% of people don't turn up, it's a fact. So you either fly empty a plane or you overbook and it's a question of how do you manage the process. So, I think um, one or two people uh, actually entered the plane because the system didn't scan one of the earlier boarding passes. So that's a more honest mistake, if you know what I mean. The, the, crew, the, the gate operator didn't scan the boarding pass, so the computer thought that person was not on board, looked at the number and said, there is a seat. You can go on board. And of course, it wasn't correct, and then it had to be. But at least they were not sitting down. And it was not for, for a crew member to take their seat. So I think United has got to the stage. They're so big, they, <laughs> they, they don't think rationally anymore. You know, they, also, you know, big companies feel very powerful. You know, we can call the police. You know, you're being disrupted. I mean, you can see how this escalates. Eh? 
the crew members said, you know, we are, you know, we are the, the law here, and we'll get someone to remove you. Anyway. It's interesting. That this is streamed now. I'll probably get a lot of abuse from United Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We had a, a feedback session of students today, and one of the, the feedbacks uh, was that the one thing they took from LZ is the learning that everything is made up. So they said socially constructed, but that is essentially that the regulations that no, make no sense in a way at some point in some context it, they made sense but then they scale up and it doesn't seem to make sense anymore and that's I guess the value of entrepreneurship then to question that and say mm. what could be an alternative so um, very interesting um, yeah we have another Stelios here uh, who's uh, <coughs> and we have the fa same first name yes good can you please uh, switch on his microphone? If not, yeah, we'll take the other microphone. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing lecture. Uh, my name is Stelios Georgoulas. I've done a master's in management 2009 uh, here at LSE, but um, I'm an eye surgeon. And so what I want to ask you is, is very, your story is very interesting, but we're living in very kind of challenging years politically. You said that you're not a politician, but what we're experiencing in this country is the Brexit, and in Europe, a huge turmoil between which country is going to stay in the EU, which country is going to leave the EU. I have two questions for you, if you have time to answer. First of all, how you feel managing a brand and a business staying in Britain? Second. You made some comments about Greece. How do you feel the future of the Greek nation is going to be? Because what I observe as a citizen of Europe is that Greece has lost in the last nine years not only 40% of GDPs, has lost the ports, the banks, the railways, and a huge number of property, plus the pensions, the salaries, and all sorts of other things. So. How do you see the prosperity of the nation, together with the fact that the, with the, the, the brain drain, 500,000 people educated by Greek families in the Greek country have left the country and are working for other nations around the world? Thank you. And some of the brightest are in this room, isn't it? <laughs> um, I was hoping we'll avoid Brexit, but here, <laughs> here we go. Um, I promised myself not to speak out in favor or against Brexit before the referendum. I, I, again, I kept this sort of uh, idea that I'm not a politician. You know, fundamentally, I'm a businessman. You know, why would anybody care about my public opinion? Um, then, of course, um, you know, the, the vote happened, the referendum happened. And there is no escaping that I'm not a you know, an innocent bystander, and, and, and someone who's indifferent. Um, EasyJet is the product of European integration and has helped European integration. You, you know, when I started the first flight from Luton to Glasgow, um, <clears throat> it, it wasn't obvious that the next step would be to fly between Rome and Milan, or Paris and Nice, or uh, Athens and Milan, for that matter. So, the fact that over the last 22 years this miracle has happened and everybody can move around Europe freely is both good for EasyJet and EasyJet has made it happen. So I'm biased. You know, I, I want, at least in aviation, things to stay the same. Now, um, what do I believe will happen? That's more difficult. It's like predicting the oil price when I was young. So I have faith in the politicians actually compromising and you know, creating a bit of a, a fudge. So, I'm not sure anybody is exactly clear what Brexit is. So they will be talking about it for the next two, three years, and then they will present it and say, this is Brexit. And you know, it's possible that aviation would be excluded <coughs> because it's too convenient as it is, so why change it? And it's possible that the banking sector might be excluded. Who knows? You know, leave, leave it as it is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but you know, at some stage, something will happen on immigration. You know, will they allow free movement and, and, and all of these things? But remember, to run a successful, full, profitable airline, you need free movement of people. <laughs> if you have to get a visa every time you get on a plane, it's not going to be possible to, to get as many customers. So that's my view on Brexit, and it's biased. 
the, you know, he, the politicians will basically compromise and find, you know, find some things that um, they have to change and some things that they will not change. Now, on Greece, um, I think I've already said I'm very pessimistic about Greece in the sense that, you know, if, if we're down to giving food, you know, who can talk about, um, uh, you know, institutions and, and, and the banks and all the other things you mentioned? Equally, I do give, you know, entrepreneurship uh, awards, you know, people who go out and create jobs and businesses. So, um, fundamentally, I still believe the economy is a cycle. So it is possible on the next upturn that the bigger European economies will pull Greece out of recession. In, in the same way, I don't think we should blame the politicians for the downside. We shouldn't give them any credit for the upside. It will come anyway. Uh, economies are cycles. And there are much more clever people in this room who have studied economic cycles. But, you know, something happens and it changes and more people consume. And, you know, they can lift the country out of recession in, you know. What is the economic cycle? Seven years? The problem is the Greek one has been a lot longer than that. So um, we'll see. I'm sorry I couldn't be more specific on my prediction, but I've learned not to predict. <laughs> uh, let's take, make it simple and do the person next to uh, us. If the microphone is still... No, it's gone? Okay. The person with the pink shirt. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Um My name is Sal Essa, um, and I came here today because uh, I was very inspired by um, EasyJet as a brand. I think it's uh, a, you know a challenger brand, one that um, one that uh, takes on the big guys. Um, I started um, a, a brand myself called No Gunk, Just Funk. And um, it is a brand with Do dot com or what's no gunk dot com. Yeah, um, and we make chemical and a residue free. The owners always promote ourselves. You remember? Yes. You know? yes. So you, you, go. you got the commercial you go. now. You <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, you know, uh, we we make chemical free grooming products for men, and. Um, <laughs> And, and they don't have any residue either. E easy for men? Would you like to talk about it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> he, he, said, um, he said he is looking for partners. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and we have the trademark. Huh? <laughs> sure, sure. So my, my question really is about marketing and guerrilla marketing, really, because um, building a company from scratch is a struggle. I go through it every day. Um, what I want to understand is maybe, it, could you shed some light from your experience or about how you um, created <coughs> this guerrilla brand, which I feel it is. Um, I hope you agree. Um, and secondly, I wouldn't be much of an entrepreneur if I didn't pitch you an idea, which is, I think my which product... We, which we can do right afterwards, um, for the sake of time. But would we be already a great, have easy um, food addition. created, which is great. Um, <laughs> so and then easy LSC. Exactly, easy LSC, yes. <laughs> Cut half the staff. <laughs> <laughs> I was only joking. All right, next topic then. <laughs> so, um, I think it was guerrilla marketing, is it, Kevin? No exams. <laughs> no exams, okay. <laughs> um, I think guerrilla marketing is a privilege of youth and, and actually being a, an upstart, uh, you know in the sense that um, I wouldn't engage today in what I used to do when I was 28 or 30. So um, I was trying to find another photograph, which I couldn't, but th this uh, lady here, am I allowed to refer to her as a lady or a person? <laughs> <laughs> th th this person <laughs> was a celebrity from the 70s that was advertising Campari on television. And then she fell out of favor. So she was doing an advert that mentioned the word Luton Airport. The, 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 more, the, the more mature people may remember that one. Um, so who did I hire for the launch of EasyJet? I'm, I'm talking day zero, when nobody has heard of it. And we gave a press conference, so I hired Lauren Chase. And I think we paid 500 pounds or something. <laughs> so, you know, in the hope of getting the gorilla marketing effect, and you know, we're an app, a small company, and we're we're trying to grow. I didn't go for a big Hollywood celebrity. Uh, what is actually not on this page, but uh, is on, in the Museum of Brands, and if you're a brand person, you should go to that place. Um, hmm. 
Yeah, it's tiny, but um, somewhere here on the right is uh, 98, 1998, British Airways launched a competitor low-cost airline called Go. How many people remember Go? Oh, still stuck, eh? <laughs> well, we, we, we bought the company in uh, 2002. But um, when they were launched as a subsidiary of British Airways, obviously they had the deep pockets. So first flight, uh, 1998, from Stansted to Rome, how did we hijack the launch? So I literally bought 10 tickets on the first flight through the internet, and I got nine of my staff and myself, and we wore orange boiler suits, and we turned up for the first flight. <laughs> So, you know, massive publicity for the price of 70 pounds, I think, which would be cost of the ticket. But, you know, you, you have to be brave enough and hungry enough to do it. When, when you have no downside and nothing to lose, you do it. Today, I, wouldn't, I don't look good in orange boiler suits. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I think, just to give you an idea, I think we booked 10 tickets. Only eight people went because two colleagues um, sort of you know, could, you know, couldn't take the risk, they basically cancelled. So, you know, it, it is risky. You know, not all PR sort of um, um, exercises work. Go to the Museum of Brands. You'll be fascinated. Fantastic. So, um, I think now that we created two new companies, Easy Food and Easy LSE, we'll uh, take one more question, <laughs> then Stelius will have a final thought, and I will have a final quick wrap-up, and then uh, there will be the uh, reception in the old building, uh, to which we, you're very welcome. Uh, I think it is the, is it fifth floor probably? No, which, which floor is it in the, um, let's have a quick, just outside LZ. Oh, just outside here, fantastic, perfect. <laughs> even easier, even easier, so just outside here, you can't miss it. Um, so we have one you final didn't believe question. the LSE would keep it simple, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it would send them five floors up. <laughs> yes, and create a model around it. But uh, no, we'll, we'll have one more question. Um, and without wanting to, uh, we'll take the gentleman uh, over here in the middle. Uh, yeah. Oh, politically incorrect. Yes, politically incorrect. <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? I mean, uh, yes. Thank you, Stelios and Chris, for the last question. I'm George, uh, China Masters, 2008. And I came to your uh, talk at the LEC 10 years ago when I was 28 but I didn't start a startup back then. Uh. My question is on persistence and the eternal optimism. How much, how, how long should someone keep trying and failing uh, before they get a corporate job in, 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 in startups? <laughs> I mean, I would, never, I would never advise anybody to take a risk they can't afford to lose, okay? So don't mortgage the house, don't bet the farm, don't, you know. These are risky decisions, they're risky businesses. That's why they're called <laughs> startups and, and risky businesses. So take a risk you can afford to lose and know when to cut your losses. You know, the internet cafes, it was a mistake. You know, it was bound to be technically obsolete. I had to get out. So it's, uh, you know, it's... It's difficult to know whether, you know, you go as a percentage of your wealth or percentage of your income. I mean, that's the other way to measure risk. If you're making 100,000 a year, do you risk 50,000 on a new venture? Or if you have 100,000, do you risk 50,000 on a new venture? But think of it in percentages, I don't know. Still, so, say last thought from your side. Oh, my so God. What is your, I, I uh, gave you one earlier, didn't I? <laughs> I thought I gave you a thought, last thought earlier. Um, I, I try and leave, uh, leave you with an optimistic thought. I, I believe in entrepreneurship. I believe that you know, people in Greece, people in Britain, will make the economies go up again because they will start new business and they create new jobs. And you know, that's how the system works. I, I, you know, I think the capitalistic system is not perfect, but we don't have a better one. And I think if you're motivated by profit, I think you achieve great things and, and, and that grows the economy and creates wealth and, and, and prosperity all around. So go and create businesses. Thank you. Uh, so, well, thank you properly. Thank you. Um, 
Sinis, thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Um, be, being a German, I have to close on a, on a philosophical note. Uh, which, uh, who of you came across Viktor Frankl, the psychoanalyst in the Vienna in the old days? Yeah. So, so Viktor Frankl, um, he survived the Holocaust and, and he um, survived um, uh, two, three concentration camps. And he always wondered, why did I, Victor, psychologically um, survive? Why did I keep hope while others, I mean, physiologically, you didn't have a choice, but psychologically, a lot of people lost hope. And he uh, tells the story of the flight instructor. Uh, and the flight instructor told him, look, Victor, if you want to fly like this, you have to start like this because the wind will pull you down. So if you start as a uh, rationalist, you end up as a depressionalist. But if you start as an optimist, you end up as the real realist. And so essentially, he took that from uh, Goethe, who was writing uh, poems in Germany, who said that if you take man as he is, or sh her as she is, uh, you make him worse. But if you take man as what he could be, you make him capable of becoming what he can be. And I believe Stelios represents a lot of this kind of rational optimism of saying, we need to both understand like, what is the kind of proper business model of something, but at the same time, see the best in people, see what's possible out there as responsible citizens. And I think over dinner we'll discuss a lot if that could be integrated, how it could be integrated, and I think that will be a whole uh, interesting discussion. But I think uh, Stelios uh, embodies a lot of, of these kind of more philosophical thoughts. So we are very delighted that you uh, joined us here at the LSE. We hope you'll come back uh, very soon. Uh, with this, I um, would love to thank you as alumni that you are with us on this uh, journey. I uh, wish you a very beautiful uh, evening and uh, hopefully see you very soon. Good evening. Thank you.